Hello and welcome to the discussion. This channel is here to serve as a platform for scholarly discussions about some of the most significant questions regarding the historical Jesus, early Christian history, the philosophy of religion, and thoughtful theology. My name is Nahoa, and I'm here to ask those questions, to seek truth openly and critically, and to share the journey with you. Right now, we're going to focus on the historical Jesus, especially how to assess the various layers of traditions about him. What was at the heart of Jesus' teaching? Apocalypticism? Torah? Pacifism? Radical love? And what did Jesus think of himself? Did he consider himself to be a prophet, uh, e even maybe akin to the great Moses, a, a king of Israel, a divine figure, perhaps even the God of the Jewish scriptures? And regarding the Gospels as historical sources, what are some consistent patterns that we see? And are any such themes throughout the Gospels actually not authentic? These are some of the questions we'll get into. The scholar joining and teaching us today should need no introduction since he's an eminent New Testament scholar whom I've had the pleasure of interviewing once before. I'll just mention once again that he is Richard J. Dearborn, professor of New Testament at Princeton Theological Seminary. So, without further introduction, Dr. Dale Allison, how are you? I'm fine. How are you today? Good. Uh, I, I'm actually wonderful, and I'm ready to oh, um, kind of ask you some questions. It's an honor to have you back on, and last time we spent a while discussing preliminary issues, so this time let's just delve right into the main discussion. Okay. When I was kind of introduced to historical Jesus studies from an apologetic perspective, I learned the typical criteria of authenticity, such as the criteria of embarrassment, dissimilarity, and multiple attestation. In, con uh, in contrast to most scholars, you actually don't tend to use these criteria in reconstructing the historical Jesus. So instead of going sort of passage by passage, trying to determine which particular logia Jesus uttered and which particular things he did, you look for recurring traditions. And although I am personally inclined to value the usual criteria slightly more than you, I do appreciate your top-down approach, and I think we should first prioritize analyzing themes. So, when you do study these themes and patterns throughout various traditions, what do you think they reveal about Jesus? And I, I, I know that's a pretty broad question. So, we can compartmentalize it into his authentic teachings, the heart of his actions, and kind of how he probably understood himself. Okay, so maybe, maybe you'll allow me to do this, but um, since what I do is not the thing that most people do, I'd like to back up first and explain where I'm coming from or how I ended up where, where I am. So sure. when, I, when I was uh, much younger, I learned all about the criteria and I was taught them and I employed them in my first book and in my second book, and my third book, and my fourth book. And uh, that means that for about 20 years, I operated with these criteria. But what happened to me is, uh, first of all, I noticed that scholars were using the same tools to get very different results. So one person would use coherence and come to a conclusion that someone else didn't using the same uh, criterion. And as I began to think about it and reflect on my own work, I realized that these criteria had, <laughs> had been putty in my hands and I was using them to get results that I wanted or that I expected or I anticipated. I was not really sitting there with no knowledge and then I looked at a bunch of material and then I took the tools and figured out what was there. And I decided that, that nobody does that. So that's the first thing that happens. I happened. I was simply um, disillusioned with my own uh, procedure, how I did things, and I was um, troubled by the way in which uh, competent, well-informed scholars using the same tools could come to very, very different ideas. And then uh, the second thing that happened is that one of the foundations of this approach just fell away. So if you're talking about multiple attestation, you're talking about traditions, sayings, or, or accounts of events that appear in more than one 
source. And logically, this makes sense. You want independent witnesses for something. Well, one of the things that happened is that I decided after a long time, and this was a painful and difficult decision, but I, had, I decided that while John contains some independent material, it also knows Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And up to that point, I had operated uh, with the nice and very handy, um, uh, convenient fact that whenever something was in John and the synoptics, I could say independent attestation. I can't do that anymore. I'm also not at all sure that uh, Mark and the so-called Q source are independent. I don't know that they're not, but let me tell you how I how I started thinking about this. So in the New Testament, there's a character named John Mark, and there's also a guy named Luke. They actually show up, both of them in the book of Acts. They are both companions of Paul. And actually in one of Paul's letters, they show up, well, Colossians, I think Paul wrote Colossians or had something to do with it. So in at least two letters, they're actually side by side in the text. They clearly clearly are at the same place at the same time. So I asked myself, what would happen if the tradition were right, that Luke wrote Luke Acts and that John Mark wrote Mark? But two of these people who wrote two of our gospels, one of whom is supposed to have known Q, the other of whom wrote Mark, what if they actually knew each other? And what if they were actually companions of Paul? Well, think of what this does, for example, when it comes to the Last Supper, everyone says, well, we have at least three accounts. We have Mark, we have Luke's different account, and then we have Paul's account in 1 Corinthians. I think if Mark wrote Mark and Luke wrote Luke and Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, these three people had to have been together at Christian religious services. They had to have been together when the words of institution were read or recited. That doesn't constitute independent witnesses for me. I also decided that um, <clears throat> that while I, I'm not sure that John Mark wrote Mark, I'm pretty confident that the tradition is right about Luke Acts. Okay? Also, if the guy who wrote Luke Acts has a copy of Q and he's hanging around with Mark, what sense does it make to think that they're not talking about Jesus, they're not talking about their materials, that Mark has no clue that the, his friend uh, has access to this thing called Q? So multiple attestation has just gone out the window for me. There are other uh, problems with this, but uh, those, those are among them. Uh, I could go on and talk about the criterion of coherence. I just don't think it's very useful. I think we're always, whoever we are, we're trying to um, create a coherent picture of Jesus. But Matthew thought he had a coherent picture. Everything in Matthew was coherent for Matthew, right? Everything. Everything in Luke is coherent for Luke. And so when scholars on the ground of consistency would say, well, this thing in, in Matthew doesn't fit with something else, or this thing in Luke doesn't fit with something else. I'm very skeptical. I'm skeptical that Jesus was more consistent, for example, than Matthew or, or, or Luke. Now, the one uh, criterion that I do pay attention to is so-called embarrassment, although I don't really like the word. I prefer something like uh, Gerrit Thyssen. It just cuts across the grain. It doesn't look like uh, something the Christians would have invented. So I think that um, this works for some things. I don't think the Christians made up the story of John the Baptist. I don't think they made up the the uh, memory that some people thought Jesus was possessed. So there are these things in the tradition. The problem is there aren't that many of them. They don't give you a full picture of Jesus. They just don't do that much work. So while I'm sitting here, thinking about these things, I'm asking myself, well, is there some better way to go about this? And I didn't come up with anything new. If you actually read the literature, you'll find that almost everybody at some point will take these large snapshots and they'll say, well, for example, they'll say, there are lots of exorcism stories. So Jesus must have been an exorcist, no matter you know what we make of any particular story. And whatever we make of any particular parable, uh, 
Jesus must have spoken in parables because there are so many in, in, in different places. So I decided this way of operating uh, would be the safest place to go, a foundation, if you will. And uh, so that's, that's what I did. I, wasn't, I never claimed to be doing anything new. What I claimed to be doing is uh, putting in the background the criteria of, of dissimilarity, which maybe, maybe they work for a handful of things, but I didn't think that they worked for, for, for most things. So I wanted to look for patterns, repeating patterns in the gospel, what I call recurrent attestation. Uh, recurrent uh, attestation of themes, motifs, rhetorical strategies. And then once I have a pattern, then the question is, can I authenticate uh, the pattern? And uh, what does the pattern tell us about Jesus? So that's a, that's a long story. That's all, that's all background there. But what it means is that I'm being really simple-minded and commonsensical, I think, about where I start. And this is just to look at the, the Gospels and see what sorts of things keep repeating, right? So if Jesus didn't speak in parables, then I think the Gospels um, are so poor when it comes to memory that we really can't say anything about this character. If he didn't speak about the kingdom of God, then the sources are just... Uh, so lousy that we we should be skeptics. Same thing with son of man idiom, whatever exactly it meant, uh, that's up for debate. But there has to be son of man language with Jesus himself to explain what we have uh, all over the place. So again, very simple common sense, but I think you can do a lot more with this than some people have thought. Let me give you one e example and then I'll, I'll quit talking. So in John Meyer's book, uh, In Marginal Jew on the Parables, volume five, I think it is, he says that um, we have 30 some narrative parables attributed to Jesus. Then he claims that you can only authenticate four of them, four of them at the end of the day. And then he discusses these four. Okay. But he does say Jesus spoke in parables and that we know this because of all the parables. I think what we should do next is not try to authenticate this parable or that parable, which is a very difficult business. I think what we should do is look at all the parables and see if they have something more in common besides just being parables. And when I do this, I see, for example, that the theme of judgment comes up in a lot of these. And I think the parables tell you that Jesus thought a lot about judgment. Um, if you look at the parables as a group, you also will see that they often feature uh, a triad, maybe an authority figure and then two subordinates or a father and two sons or, um, you know, the main figure and then two groups. This is a repeating pattern. And I think it tells us something about Jesus. I think he composed or liked to compose parables with this sort of structure. So I'm looking at the parables as a whole and I'm asking, what can I infer? I'm doing the same thing when I look at exorcism stories or the sayings about the kingdom of God. So this is the way I proceed. I find a pattern and then I ask, what does this pattern mean? tell us about Jesus once I've come up with some decent reasons for attributing the pattern to the church and not not Jesus. That's valuable. Thank you. And methodology is super important to our audience. You can see kind of how this plays out in Dr. Allison's uh, more recent published work. And also earlier this year, you gave a three-part lecture series at Yale, correct? Yeah, I did. Uh -huh. Yeah, and okay, so I'll, I'll link that in the description because you talk about you talk about Jesus as like uh, Matthew portrays Jesus as a sort of new Moses, but you argue argue that that actually goes back to the historical Jesus. Jesus tried to imitate and model his own life upon the life of Moses in certain respects. You talk about methodology and Jesus as a as a miracle worker or some kind of supernatural or he's believed to be a, mm -hmm. a, a supernatural sort of metanormal figure. So that's, that's really important. 
And you said we should ask what things repeat throughout the Gospels. What are recur- what's um, attested recurringly? And so let me ask you that. What is attested recurringly with respect to his teachings, um, his actions, and his self-understanding? Well, well, so again, there's, I don't think there's anything profound here. I, don't, I think this is commonsensical. Now, of course, you have to fill out the details by looking at uh, comparative Jewish material and, and, and so on and so on. But if you're looking at Jesus' teaching, the first thing you say is, well, he, he taught about the kingdom of God. In fact, it looks like this is the central theme of, of his proclamation. And then if you ask, what is this about? Well, it looks like it's near. In some places, it sounds like it's present. Um, it clearly involves judgment. It sometimes involves reward. Uh, it does not seem to be something that human beings uh, enact or force or can implement on their own. It seems to be a divine um, activity or something that, that God realizes. Uh, I think it remakes the face of the world. So that's the sort of thing you do. You just look at the the sayings all about kingdom of God and the parables about kingdom of God, and you ask, what are the things that repeat most of all? And that's where you go to. In addition, you just you just look at the synoptic uh, tradition. You look at the sayings, you include John. You, you see God as father everywhere. Now that is in Jewish tradition and it's in Christian tradition, but it's remarkably recurrent in the sayings of, of Jesus. So these are the sorts of things that, that I look at and then um, start my project from. And I think you can go uh, way further than this, with this than most people have. Maybe that's the, the reason I've gotten some attention for this um, because I think everybody starts with this. They just don't think you could do that much with it. I could think you could do a lot more with it. They start out, they, they'll say, Jesus was an exorcist. We know this because look at all the material. And then immediately they try to go to the individual pieces. And I'm still standing back looking at the whole, asking what is uh, recurrent within the, these, these large patterns themselves. If you... Uh, you know, if you want to go on to actions. Uh, so wait, just before we move on there, uh, a, a few more questions about his teachings. You mentioned the kingdom of God, and it's clear that Jesus often talks about uh, God as father, this son of man, whether he's referring to himself or it's a Jewish idiom for just uh-huh. a human being or wh- whatever the case, he talks about a son of man constantly. And he talks about the kingdom of God. His, his ethic is an ethic of repentance and the motivation or the foundation for a lot of his teachings is teaching about the kingdom of God. And so kind of, you, you already mentioned it a little bit, but what is this kingdom in Jewish thought uh, more generally? And I know Juda- ancient Judaism and Judaism today is not a monolith, but what are some themes throughout Jewish literature about what the kingdom is? Is it distinctly eschatological? Um, and, and if it is, you know, I, I interviewed Dr. John Dominic Crossan a, a, a little bit ago, and he denies all of the sayings about the kingdom as a future reality. He says the kingdom uh-huh. is eschatological, but it's it's here and now and not something you wait for God to do in the future. So maybe talk uh-huh. a little bit about that. Well, so for me, uh, there was a German scholar, a very famous German scholar, Back in the day, middle of the 20th century, named Joachim Jeremias, he wrote a book on the parables of Jesus. And on the very last page of this book, he uh, uses an expression, eschatology in the process of realization. Mm. And I think that accurately gets what Jesus was thinking. So for Jesus, the consummation, utopia, the end, is at hand. But it's also influencing the present. It's already dawning. It's already casting uh, its reality forward. So even now, Satan is being routed and defeated. One of the themes, you asked about Jewish expectation. One of the themes in Jewish literature is that Satan and evil spirits and sin will be destroyed. They will be wiped out. They will be no more. And Jesus is already engaged in the conquest of of Satan 
and the conquest of, of evil spirits. He's also already celebrating, right? Uh, the new has come, the way Mark 2 puts it, the bridegroom is here and there's new wine and you can't put new wine in old wineskin. So there is a sense of the new. It's also there uh, I think in, in Luke 10, where Jesus says, maybe it's a visionary statement, I don't know, that he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. It's there uh, in Matthew 12, where uh, if I, by the finger of God, cast out demons, then the finger of God has come upon you. Um, it's there in Luke what, 17, 21. Uh, they won't say here or there, but the kingdom of God is in your midst or among you. So, I don't see any problem at all with thinking like this. And the truth is, if you look at Jewish uh, apocalyptic literature or Jewish eschatology, often the kingdom doesn't come in the blink of an eye. It often comes over time. And in the book of Jubilees, for example, is some sort of process. And I think this might be mirrored in Jesus's uh, parables where he's thinking about the, the growth of something which then has a culmination in, in the kingdom. So uh, I don't see any antithesis between present and future. I think that's an artificial uh, distinction created by modern academics. It's not part uh, of Jesus's thought. It's not part of the evangelist thought. If you look at Paul, if you look at Paul's authentic epistles, he speaks of the kingdom of God as future, and he speaks of it as present. Paul's more systematic, it seems to me, than Jesus. And if he can do this, uh, Jesus can do this. Now, to go back to the question of, uh, of kingdom in Judaism, kingdom is one of those phrases that's like God, I mean, or terms like God. It's used in multiple different respects. But in a number of texts, Dead Sea Scrolls, Jewish Apocalyptic, and uh, in, in a number of texts, the kingdom stands for the world that God will remake, the world that God intended. Uh, if you want to, you could call it what Christians later came to call the millennium, right? The Messianic Age. Um, I don't think Jesus has a clear distinction between the messianic age and the age to come as the rabbis do, but um, he's looking forward to a world in which the hungry aren't hungry anymore. He's looking at a world in which the first have become last and the last become first. Everything has changed. Um, Jewish texts often have really radical expectations of what this new world uh, will be like. They're picking up on Old Testament prophecies, like the lion will lie down with the lamb. It's not a metaphor for these folks. Philo has a passage, for example, where he says that one day nature will be tamed and it will be just like it is in Isaiah. The world will be completely different. So that's what they're looking for. They're looking for God's uh, a world in which God's will is done here as it is now in heaven. They're looking for utopia. They're looking for the millennium. They're looking for the messianic age. So since I can uh, see kingdom language conjoined with that in Jewish texts, and since I see it conjoined with that in the Gospels, uh, my conclusion uh, follows from that. So, uh, Professor Crossan and I uh, have disagreements on that. Um, throughout Jesus' teachings, Jesus sort of intensifies certain commandments in the Torah, such as in some uh, antitheses on, on murder and adultery. In other areas, he relaxes Torah regulations, such as uh, with, with Sabbath regulations and questions about cleanness and disputes about purity. He reaffirms the Torah constantly throughout his teachings, and mm -hmm. it seems like he reverses uh, certain kind of motivations for commandments in Torah. For example, the antithesis yeah. about eye for eye, tooth for tooth. In, in Deuteronomy, the motivation is that you shall purge the evil from your midst, that Israel shall hear, fear, and, and be pure. 
Jesus kind of reverses that whole thing with radical love, dare I say pacifism, um, and he, he re- references the Torah all the time, Queen of the South, Solomon, Sign of Jonah, you know, he, he quotes from the Psalms and, and Isaiah and, and Genesis, and, but he also seems to rebuke, or I don't know if that's too strong a word, but he rebukes certain parts such as in the antithesis about s- fulfilling your vows to the Lord, he says, do not swear an oath by heaven or by, by earth, and anything more than a yes or no is from the evil one. And so it, it seems like Jesus uh, upholds but also kind of uh, adjusts the Torah with his sense of, w- with his self-conceived sense of authority. So do you think it'd be right to characterize him as something like a semi-liberal with respect to his regard on the Torah? <laughs> I, I wouldn't use that language. And I certainly wouldn't call Jesus an antinomian. So Jesus is a Jew. Right. He lives within Torah. He assumes its authority. But I think there are at least two things to say here, maybe three things to say. So the first thing to say is that Jesus uh, believes that he is on an all-important mission. And if that mission requires something that means an individual will not fulfill a commandment in Torah, then the kingdom, Jesus, trumped that. For example, uh, he, he calls a person uh, in the so-called Q text, if you believe it, in Q, but it's in Matthew and, and Luke. He calls an individual, come follow me, right? Come follow me. And the guy says, I got to marry my dad first. Well, in Judaism, burying your parents uh, belongs to the Decalogue. That's one of the ways you honor your parents. And if you don't bury them, you're dishonoring them and you're breaking Torah. So Jesus is there. Let the dead bury their own dead. Jesus is saying, my commandment, my demand trumps that imperative in this case. This is not a general teaching. Nobody should honor parents anymore. That's not what's going on at all. Judaism recognizes that commandments can come into conflict. So, for example, in the book of Maccabees, um, the, the, the nation is suffering because the, its enemies have discovered that, hey, the best time to attack, to attack is on Saturday. These people are, are resting. It's the Sabbath. So if we attack them on the Sabbath, we'll win. And the leaders, the, the Maccabean leaders said, you know what? We have a choice here. We can keep the Sabbath and we'll all die, in which case there won't be a nation anymore to keep the Sabbath, or we'll fight on the Sabbath, we'll break Torah, but it is ultimately the right thing to do. Or again, the rabbis would discuss what happens when um, you're supposed to circumcise on the eighth day, but that turns out to be Saturday, turns out to be the Sabbath. You can't fulfill both commandments. You can't rest on the Sabbath and circumcise on the eighth day always. So Judaism recognizes that there are conflicting imperatives. In fact, there's a really interesting passage in the Babylonian Talmud where uh, it says that when the prophet like Moses shows up, you should obey him even if he asks you to disobey a commandment in the Torah. And then it notes as an aside, when Elijah offered a sacrifice on Mount Carmel, and you're not supposed to do that, you only sacrifice in Uh, Jerusalem, but sometimes, you know, uh, according to the needs of the hour, that's what it says, the needs of the hour, uh, one um, imperative trumps another. And I think that's part of what Jesus is doing, that that explains why he he calls somebody away from burial duty, which would seem like uh, breaking the Decalogue. I also think that Jesus because he's oriented to the eschaton, because he's thinking of um, the end, is also thinking uh, of the beginning. The beginning will be like the end. The end will be like the beginning. Um, the eschaton will restore God's will as it was before before the fall uh, and everything went, went poorly. If you look at Mark 10, Jesus says at one point, well, from the beginning it was not so. It appears that the imperative uh, not to divorce 
is a reversion back to a pre-fallen state and that um, Moses's uh, legislation on this is a concession to sin. But in a world where sin will be gone, evil will be defeated, there, there's not going to be any need for uh, divorce uh, proceedings. Same thing with swearing oaths. Good grief. In the new age, nobody's going to swear an oath. Why do you need an oath? In the, in the world to come, there will be no dishonesty. Everybody will tell the truth. The only reason you have oaths is because people lie. The world to come, people aren't going to lie. There's not going to be any need for oaths. By the way, I should, as a, a footnote to all this, just simply observe that if you look at Matthew 5, 21 through 48, these so-called antitheses, if you obeyed all of them, if you obeyed Jesus, you would not be breaking Torah. If you don't get a divorce, you're not breaking Torah. There is no command uh, to divorce in the Torah. If you don't take an oath, you're not breaking any commandment in the Torah. If you simply tell the truth all the time, you're not breaking uh, Torah. If you turn the other cheek, you're not breaking Torah. So uh, you have to think practically too. What 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 does breaking Torah the, the, the last thing to say is that when, for example, Jesus is accused of breaking the Sabbath, uh, Jews themselves debated what Sabbath keeping meant, how far you could walk, what things were allowed, what things were disallowed. And Jesus is part of that conversation. And I think that all of his um, actions on the Sabbath uh, you could find some parallel to them in, in Jewish sources. So he's certainly not uh, what you would call an antinomian, but he is in a different situation. The new is come, as it says in what, Matthew 11, the law and the prophets were until John. They're not gone, but they have a different force and a different application in view of uh, the kingdom of God, which brings a, a new state of things. So there's a long rambling answer to your question about uh, Torah. No, I appreciate that. It, it seems like in your explanation of how Jesus, Jesus' views on the Torah are within the bounds of Judaism, because there were there were lots of perspectives within Judaism. Um, but uh, one kind of distinctive thing about Jesus is that he views himself and the, the people of the world as in this new messianic age of, of righteousness, and that kind of explains a lot of his attitude toward the Torah. Is that correct? I think so. Although, you know, there are also practical things that we, we never think about uh, and, and we should. So Jesus isn't just going around um, uttering halakhic rulings uh, randomly. Um, now, Let's say Mark, Mark 10 does have the Pharisees coming up and asking him what he thinks about Moses and, and divorce. So that's presented as a sort of theoretical, halakhic um, discussion. But Jesus also had disciples. He had hearers. He had men and women who were following him around. And you always have to ask yourself, what did they make of this? What they would have made of this was, oh, I can't get divorced. I, uh, if Peter is thinking of his, uh, of leaving his wife because he finds Mary Magdalene attractive, that's not going to be, that's not going to be an option, right? Um, so you also have to ask uh, how these things are actually lived out by the people who are following Jesus around, and Jesus has to be conscious uh, of of that, right? So any anyway, we we often just sit back and think of Jesus as though he's a, a, a rabbi, as though it's a discussion in the Mishnah. And, uh, you know, he has leisure to ponder these things. But I'm guessing that for all this stuff, there were practical things going on and practical repercussions to, to what he was saying. When you're explaining your methodology, you look for patterns and then you see uh, whether or not these could plausibly be authenticated. And so it's not just if there's a pattern, it's definitely historical. So I'm curious, yeah. are there any yeah. significant recurring traditions that plausibly do not go back to the historical Jesus? So that's a really good question. And I don't think, uh, to be honest, I've ever given any reflection on that. Uh, so I don't know what my answer to your question would be. 
maybe you can, if you've thought of this, can you give me an example that that might fit here? Yeah, I was thinking one um, in light of William Reda's uh, the Messianic Secret uh-huh. might be the motif of secrecy, um, which serves a c- clear literary purpose. But it's not all that implausible that that you know that the historical Jesus wanted to keep himself, uh, keep his identity concealed either. So that that's a potential one. And, and then maybe one other one could be sayings about the kingdom as a present reality. Because you wrote an article a while ago called "A Plea for Thoroughgoing Eschatology," where you interpret Ooh. sort of everything in in the yep. Jesus traditions through the lens of a sort of future apocalyptic eschatology. But you yeah. mentioned in this wonderful book, The Historical Christ and the Theological Jesus, that you've, <laughs> you, you've renounced that position um, and, and that you don't try to see everything through one completely unifying lens. Mm-hmm. So th- those are two examples, motif of secrecy and sayings about the kingdom as a present reality. Okay. So, so first of all, about the messianic secret, I think if I sat down and thought about this, which I haven't, but I think what I would say to you is that this does not rise to the level of recurrent attestation. Because for me, Hmm. recurrent attestation is a theme or motif that occurs across the sources. So this is not a theme in Paul. It's not a theme in John. Heck, in John, Jesus is out publicly saying everything. It's It's actually in Matthew there but he doesn't add to this motif. He, it's as though at points he'll just take it over from Mark, but he doesn't do anything with it. He doesn't expand it. It's the same thing in Luke. Luke doesn't pick this up and run with it. He doesn't add anything to it. So as far as I'm concerned, I think off the top of my head, this is a Markan phenomenon. And that in itself means that it's not what I mean by a recurrent motif, because it has to be in multiple sources. There's nothing about this in Q, for example, or M material, or L material, or John, or or, or Paul. And then what I would say, adding to that, is I'm not sure that what Vereda does um, is entirely correct, because he tends to take all these secret, um, these verses that have to do with secret and and put them together. But um, I think maybe Jesus on occasion said things to uh, immediate followers, his intimate circle, that he didn't tell everybody else. That's completely reasonable to me. In fact, nothing else makes much sense. I also would guess that on occasion, maybe if he was um, in an exorcistic uh, situation, and he would not want a demon to say his name or speak something about him because uh, in an exorcism uh, situation, names are power. Anyway, my point would be there is a literary scheme in Mark, but I think it's probably based on some things that are in his tradition, but I don't see that they are recurring. I don't see that there is evidence of them uh, elsewhere, okay? Now, as far as the presence of the kingdom, well, when I wrote that article, which is over 30 years ago now, right? Uh, I was too one-sided. What was going on there is that I was reacting to the Jesus Seminar, which was in the news at the time. They were very popular. Uh, Robert Funk and John Dominic Crossan were the the leaders, uh, and Marcus Borg was a prominent member. And I think what happened was that I disagreed with some of the things they were saying, and as sometimes happens with people, if somebody's over here, you end up going over there instead of trying to find the happy middle. So that that earlier article of mine, um, I, I later qualified. So I don't want to explain everything at all uh, in terms of eschatology. In fact, I think the best thing to say is that I think I think the historical with Jesus was like the Jesus of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, by which I mean there's a lot of eschatology there, but there are lots of other things there. And 
I think the only thing that holds everything together is probably the person of Jesus himself. This is a person-centered movement. It's a person-centered thinker. Uh, he is the one constant. So uh, what Schweitzer tends to do is he, he tends to, to take eschatology and make it the center, and he has to tie everything to it. He has to connect everything to it. And I, I don't think that's the case. For example, I think Jesus' ethic uh, is derived from Jewish tradition. It's intensified by eschatological expectation, but it's not given by eschatological expectation. There's also wisdom, if, wisdom traditions in, in his ethic, pervading his sure, ethic. Of course there are. And, and again, that's a modern um, distinction that I'm very uneasy with. So wisdom and apocalyptic, uh, they both are together in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're both together in Q. They're, they're, they're both together in the Synoptic Gospels. I don't see any reason to think they couldn't have been together uh, in Jesus. I, I'm pretty confident that, that, that they were. Um, you, you always have to be careful here of overreaching with a, a, a genre. So if you look at the book of Proverbs, Proverbs doesn't talk about Moses. But Proverbs doesn't talk about the Red Sea. Proverbs doesn't talk about the conquest of the land. Proverbs misses most of the the major events in Jewish history. Is that because the authors or contributors didn't know those things or didn't care about those things? I don't think so. I am sure if we could interview them that uh, there were many things that they believed that didn't show up in their wisdom sayings. So uh, people are big. Uh, people are spacious, people have worlds within them, and uh, you can be apocalyptic and sapiential at the same time. That's helpful. Uh, maybe one more example of a potential recurring tradition okay. um, could be, okay, so for context, you say that Jesus thought of himself as a an exalted figure. You say in Constructing Jesus that... Uh -huh. Uh, the idea that Jesus entertained no exalted views about himself needs to die. Um, but although he thought of himself as some kind of divine figure, as the uh, the eschatological judge, the, the bringer of the the new age, huh? the eschaton, you wouldn't say he thought of himself as, as Yahweh, as the God of the Jewish scriptures, right? Um, and, and one thing I see, I, I see it repeatedly, although I'm not sure if this would classify as a recurring tradition, but people fall at Jesus' feet and they worship him when he calms the storm at the resurrection. So you might say this is a post-Easter phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, but I I'm curious what you think about that and maybe beyond that specific example of falling at his feet and worshiping him, the distinction between Jesus considering himself to be divine versus Jesus mm -hmm. not thinking of himself as the I am before Abraham. <laughs> I see. Okay. Well, those are two two different questions. So let me see if I can unravel the the first one. So, if if I were to to talk about worship of Jesus and falling down before Jesus in the synoptic tradition, I'd have to distinguish two things. So on the one hand, I'd be looking at use of of a Greek verb proskuneo, and that literally means fall towards or in front of somebody. And it's used of worship. It can be translated as worship in some context, but it's also something that people do before high officials, before kings, and uh, it's not reserved for the deity. And if you look at the statistics on this, um, I think I think that this is only a prominent word in Matthew. I think yeah. it's only prominent in Matthew. I think in Luke, it occurs only in the uh, temptation scene and then at the very end uh, of the book. And in Mark, uh, it occurs when Jesus is on the cross and it's mocking prostration. And there it's a royal motif, right? He's got a scepter and a crown and mm -hmm. and uh, so on. Uh and then the other one is, is a demoniac. So if you're looking at this verb, this does not seem to me to rise to the occasion of 
recurrent attestation. The other thing is, is that in Matthew, it's really hard to get a hold of the meaning uh, of this. The Magi show up and they, um, the text uses this verb of them in chapter two. They come in order to what? Worship the king. And then in 28, I think it's 17, right at the end, the last pericope, um, the risen Jesus is worshiped, but some doubt. Um, throughout Matthew, though, this occurs, and it's sort of like, for me, it's sort of on the border. It's it's getting close to worship, but I'm not sure it's it's there, right? Now then, that takes, oh, and, and then, in addition to that, there are people who fall down before Jesus, but that, you know, I'd have to go through all of those, but Falling down in front of somebody is often a way of petitioning somebody uh, mm. in the ancient world. Or grabbing somebody's feet is a way of asking a favor. Please, please, will you do this for me? Uh, I'm guessing that most of the people who fall at Jesus' feet, most of them uh, in the Gospels are people who are asking for something. But I'd have to go through and, and, mm. and, and look that up. As far as, <laughs> as, far as your... Other question goes, I don't really have an answer for this because um, I think Jesus had exalted conceptions about himself. But what we're always trying to do, I think, even when we deny this, is we're reading back later Christian ideas of Trinity or divinity into the first century. So we're saying, we're asking, was Paul a Trinitarian? Was Matthew a Trinitarian? Uh, Larry Hurtado is asking, were the earliest Christians Binitarians? Um, I actually don't know what first century Jews exactly meant when they um, spoke about God. I am not sure what they meant. I do not understand what's going on in the book of Genesis, where you have the angel of the Lord, who seems at times to be the Lord, but also seems to be an angel. I have no idea what the author of Daniel was doing when the one like a son of man comes and gets receives this kingdom. And then the old white haired guy who's clearly God sort of departs and is replaced. It sounds like old Canaanite myth where you have one God coming and replacing the other God. Uh, this figure is an exalted figure. Is it an angel? Oh, well, maybe. Uh, if it's an angel, uh, it's a really, um, <laughs> it's a spectacular angel, and it's the the top angel. Um, there is a later Jewish text called um, Third Enoch, which has a figure called Little Yahweh. What am I supposed to do with that? It's got Yahweh on the throne, but then it's got a little Yahweh. The little Yahweh actually is too uppity and he gets punished. They whip him at some point for thinking too highly of himself. Um, anyway, the point is, is that I inevitably operate with clear and distinct ideas derived from Christian theological tradition. And I, I think that if I read Paul, there are clear distinctions between father and son. Uh, on the other hand, Jesus isn't exactly an ordinary human being. He's exalted and he's in many ways associated with God. The problem is that what, what we're always trying to do is we're trying to take the data, I guess we have to, and plug it into categories that we understand. So did Jesus think he was Yahweh? I don't think so. I don't think that's how he would formulate whatever this was, but I think it is an exalted conception. Um, in constructing Jesus, I played with an idea and I'm never going to return to it. Maybe it's a bad idea, but a number of scholars have observed that in the Son of Man saints, Jesus is talking about himself in the third person, right? And so somebody like Rudolf Bultmann said that Jesus was probably thinking about another exalted figure. Well, I don't think so. On the other hand, if the Son of Man is a heavenly figure uh, in some Jewish texts, it does make me wonder. Maybe Jesus somehow, <laughs> this is going to sound really strange. Maybe Jesus thought of himself as having uh, 
uh, a counterpart in the heaven. Uh, there are lots of lots of ancient texts, Persian texts, uh, Jewish texts, Greco-Roman texts, in which people have heavenly doubles. This sounds, sounds very strange to us, although in our tradition it comes down to us in uh, the notion of a guardian angel, that we have a you know a, an angelic counterpart, and in in popular lore, this being actually looks like us. So you have a you have a guardian angel that looks like you and is in the heaven. Now the thing is, if you see how widespread this bizarre idea is, and then you ask, here's here's what I'm doing. I'm asking, how can I think of Jesus, or how could Jesus have thought of himself? If he's not a fourth century Christian, if he's not thinking like Athanasius or he's not a Trinitarian, because he's not, he, he, he doesn't, Jesus isn't there after 300 years of debate on this question. How are we going to formulate this, right? Uh, so I thought, well, maybe, maybe Jesus can think of himself as somehow united with this heavenly double and this person is him, but in some way it's other. That was my attempt. Maybe it, maybe it's totally implausible, but that was my attempt to get back to the first century and ask, how could you have exalted thoughts about yourself in a first century context, not in a fourth century uh, Athanasian context, okay? So what I'm doing here is I'm confessing to you that I haven't figured this out. And it's not because I haven't given it thought. I've been thinking about this for decades. And we do have these exalted figures in Judaism, like the angel of the Lord in, in Genesis. And uh, sometimes they seem to be on the side of the creature. Sometimes they're on the side of the creator. And it's weird and messy. And I'm not sure that in the first century, uh, people uh, had all this stuff sorted out. I don't know that they had things sorted out uh, any better than I do. Uh, you, you've said things in the past, in lectures and books, and even today, um, such as if the Gospels inaccurately portray Jesus as say, a preacher who often spoke about the kingdom of God or a self-conceived authoritative teacher for, for some neutrality, if they're, if they're not ac accurate in these recurring traditions, then we should be inclined to be skeptical about the gospel's reliability uh -huh. um, in general or, or their ability to preserve historical traditions and memory. So my uh -huh. question is about, um, on the one hand, hyper-skeptics who would who would say, yeah, we should be skeptical. Um, that, yeah. You know, they'd say the Gospels are primarily or even solely fictional. But on the uh -huh. other hand, there are some hyper-conservatives or perhaps simply the average lay Christian who would say that the Gospels are entirely trustworthy accounts of what Jesus said and did. So they would be taken aback when you, and probably most scholars for that matter, assert that a number of things in the Gospels probably did not occur, much less in the precise way described. So what would you say uh -huh. to, uh, to each of these sort of extremes on this spectrum, hyper-skeptics and hyper-conservatives? Okay, well, with regard to hyper-skeptics, uh, I suppose that I would say at least two things. So th the first thing would be, is, would be this. There are things in the Gospels that I don't believe early Christians made up without historical memory. So we talked about the criterion of embarrassment earlier, right. and this is where it seems to me it picks up some things that um, are really important. So I don't think early Christians without memory made up the story of their, their guy being baptized by John the Baptist. I don't think they made up the story that people thought he was, some people thought he was a glutton and a drunkard. I don't think they sat around and said, that'd be a good one, let's let's put that one uh, down. Or that he was a friend of toll collectors and sinners. Or that his family uh, in Mark 3 uh, didn't believe in him. 
Or that some people thought he was possessed by a demon, that he cast out demons by Beelzebul. So I think that there are a number of things in the Gospels for which we have no explanation, or I'm sorry, no better explanation than this is memory. And they're doing the best that they can with these memories. They're writing up the story of the Baptist and they have a dove and a voice and so on and so on. But they're working with uh, a, a memory. Uh, the second thing I would say to a skeptic is that uh, I, I don't see that skeptical scenarios can explain Paul successfully. So Paul says that he knew a guy named Peter. He knows a guy named James, who is Jesus's brother. He knows of other brothers of Jesus. Uh, he knows of another member of the so-called 12. He has been to Jerusalem. He's talked to people who know Jesus, right? If he's talked to one of Jesus's brothers, he and he thinks Jesus is an historical person, and he can quote some of the things that he said, and he has a definite idea of his personality, then that's it. That's it. Paul, all you need is Paul. Paul is writing in the middle of the first century, and he thinks Jesus is an historical figure, and he knows people who knew him. That's it. I don't think you need anything more than that. As far as the uh, hyper-conservative goes, uh, you know, I, I don't know where you start here. Um, I, I, I guess I would just start with the order of things in the Gospels. I have this really neat book. It's not to hand right now, but it's a synopsis of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it has all the stories together on one gigantic piece of paper, which is about six feet high and three feet wide. And what it does is it lists all the stories in Matthew and then all the stories in Mark and all the stories in Luke. And then with regard to the same story, it draws a line from the place in Matthew where it occurs to the place in Mark and from the place it occurs in Mark to the place in Luke. So it's looking at the same stories. Let's say the pigs ran off the cliff. It's looking at, at that story and drawing a line from uh, across the Gospels. So here's the thing. If you look at this book, the lines frequently cross. They just do. And if you, if you look at, let's say, Matthew and Mark, the call of Levi, the tax collector, it occurs before the pigs fall off the cliff in uh, Mark, but before it in Matthew. And you see this time and time and time again. So you have to say that the gospel writers were not at least, uh, at least two of them were not uh, keen on getting things in order. And by the way, the very earliest commentary we have on the gospels comes from a guy named Pepius. Um, an Asian bishop, a bishop in Asia Minor in the probably the first half of the second century. And he has a tradition about Mark and he says Mark didn't get things in order. So already somebody is comparing the gospels and saying, you know what, they don't occur uh, in the same order. By the way, uh, you do this, you do with this with John also. John has the story of Jesus in the temple. That incident is in um uh, it's in the Passion narrative, the last week in Mark, uh, but it's in chapter two in John. It takes place at the at the beginning of things. So I guess I would emphasize order. Then I would emphasize that they don't agree on wording. So if you look at the three uh, or the four, the four accounts we have of what Jesus said at the Last Supper, and there was only one Last Supper. If you put them side by side, they are not in verbatim agreement. There are differences, considerable differences between Luke, for example, and Mark. They are not the same. The uh, gist of some of the sentences is the same, but nobody, it appears, was trying to memorize exactly what Jesus had said. And um, there, are, there are differences. Now, when you go beyond different wording and different order, there are also places that I just think they have to be looked at as 
straight out contradictions. So John says Jesus was crucified at noon. Mark has him put up at the cross at nine o'clock. I don't know how to harmonize uh, those things. So um, it's, you know, there's a story of uh, Bartimaeus, right? And this occurs in Mark. It also occurs in Luke. One of them says that this guy was healed while Jesus was approaching Jericho. The other, I can't remember which one is which, says he was healed as uh, Jesus was leaving Jericho. Those are literally contradictions. So uh, this is another reason for me to stand back and say, well, I think the, the repeating themes and motifs uh, are going to be the place to start, not a particular saying or, or, or a particular story. So those those are the places I guess I would begin with your, your hyper skeptic and your hyper conservative. Thank you for that. Uh, we're approaching the end. And usually I ask some more personal questions about what you've changed your mind on or um, personal factors that don't necessarily constitute propositional evidence, but they still affect your worldview. But I already asked you those questions a few months ago. So I have a slightly different personal question. Um, and I'll, I guess I'll preface it by saying I love Jesus more now that I've learned uh, so much about him. But at the same time, it can be challenging trying to balance open truth-seeking with commitment to Christianity. I'd rather not mm -hmm. reveal too much about my personal life <laughs> online to, to an audience of people I don't know. But I will say that in the past, I feel like I've been waiting for the evidence to either confirm or falsify my religion, and that's probably a result of my history with apologetics. But I realized that I will probably never come to the conclusion that everything the Gospels teach about Jesus can be verified. Moreover, I thought, for example, will I ever be persuaded, say, by a case for Jude being an authoritative letter <laughs> written by Jesus' brother? Will evidence ever clarify who wrote Hebrews and whether its contents are divine? With questions like these, the answer is, Probably not, yet I can still value the canonical literature for theological reasons. I mean, I follow the Gospels, I love Jude, I think it's beautiful, and I think Hebrews is a theologically rich window into an early Jewish Christian tradition. And, and in your book, The Historical Christ and the Theological Jesus, you really capture a number of the dilemmas that Christ followers such as myself, who, who heed the scholarly quest for the historical Jesus, face. Throughout this journey, I've, I've been greatly influenced by your work. So I want to ask you how you distinguish and balance the historical critical with the religio-spiritual. And I know that's a okay. big question, so you can take some time yeah, to it's think. A big or, question. Yeah. It's a big question, and I don't know that I can answer it because uh, life is messy and my mind is messy and I, um, you know, I'm in different moods on different days. But uh, a, couple, a couple of things come to mind. So the first one is that objectivity is uh, an illusion. That is, everything is to some extent subjective. But having said that, there is such a thing as evidence, and there is such a thing as trying to overcome confirmation bias. And there is such a thing as sitting on a jury and trying to come to an impartial verdict. In fact, that's the jury system, if it works, presupposes that that's possible. So even though it's often hard, this is what I try to do with the historical evidence. I try not to engage in confirmation bias. I try to look at the evidence. And I, I can remember many years ago sitting down saying, uh, what do I think Matthew teaches about the law? Or did Jesus think that the end was near? Or did he have a realized eschatology? And I remember trying not to pick the one I liked. So if I had liked, if I picked the one I liked, I would have, would have said, well, Jesus was into realized eschatology. That's what I would have done because I like that personally the best. And it would have been the easiest for me to, to base a personal theology on. But I didn't do that. So 
I came to some conclusions, historical conclusions, and to the extent that they impacted my own theology, I adjusted or did my best to adjust my theology. So his, his theology isn't history, history isn't theology, but they're not totally separate. And sometimes one affects the other, right? And I've tried to be uh, an historian, and that's why when it comes down to anything I've said, uh, I always tell people, I'm irrelevant. All that matters are the arguments. If I haven't given you good arguments, then who cares about me or why I said it or, 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 or whatnot? So that's the first thing. But the second thing is, is that much of my life uh, isn't related to waiting for, you know, my next historical critical conclusion. So I have a conscience and I feel compelled to the best of my ability to be let's say charitable, hospitable, generous, to be kind. Uh, I have an imperative always to tell the truth and things large and small. I have an imperative uh, not to be proud and to seek humility and so on. I have all these moral imperatives and all these virtues I'm supposed to live into. And I do my best every day. And those things aren't related to, that is, they're not dependent upon, they're not waiting upon my latest historical critical conclusion. I wrote a big commentary on James several years ago. And I decided James, the brother of Jesus, didn't write it. I could be wrong. But it actually doesn't make any difference to my personal life. That is, the the content of the book of James that speaks to my conscience and that helps me in life. It, it speaks to me no matter who wrote it, correct? So the date of James wasn't for me a personal existential question. It was just uh, an historical question. And in that case, one that I don't think has any theological uh, repercussions. So I guess at this point, I would say, much of what I try to do day to day just isn't related to whether Q existed or not, right? Or the date of Luke or who wrote the Gospel of Mark. Uh, these moral uh, and religious questions are somehow larger and bigger than um, these historical critical questions. So I regard them as important. Um, and doing history has certainly changed how I think about all sorts of things, but um, life is bigger than uh, history, right? So maybe maybe that's beginning to get at, at what you were after. Yeah, thank you, uh, and thank you for your response to that question, and also your time and your scholarship and your um, your personality and and just. Uh, you sort of investing in in this channel. Um, I appreciate that. I appreciate our audience for watching. To you, Dr. Allison, and to our audience, peace.